We're going to continue with the subject, Ancient Truths for a Modern World, and more specifically today, talk about the greatest love story ever told. And I would suggest the greatest love story that needs to be told. Now, perhaps you have a love story of your own, and, well, Tish and I do. Um, we had started dating. Yeah, we look a little bit younger, and I look a lot thinner. We had started dating uh, primarily in February, and uh, then that spring, um, school's out. She went on northeast, southeast campaigns, and I went to South Mississippi to intern with a church. I'd already made up my mind this was the gal for me, and I hadn't told her. I told someone else that summer, though, I said I want to put a ring on her finger in, in December and marry her in May. And we got back to school, and she broke up with me. Well, we started dating again in October, and then in December, it was the night before I was to graduate. She had one more semester, and she told me, she told me, I love you. And so I said, September or next December? And she said, next December. And so we got married in May. So... I did get the ring on her finger in December, marry her in May. And that's our love story at, that continues still. Oh, if you don't have a wife yet, you young men, but yet you're a Christian, I, I read these Christian pickup lines you might want to use. I'm will, God's will for you. Now, I know why Solomon had 700 wives, because he never met you. Is your name Grace? Because you are so amazing. So last night I was reading in the book of Numbers and I realized I don't have yours. Okay, ladies, if you don't like that one, you can answer, well, here it is, 1-800-GET-LOST. <laughs> and then, is it a sin that you stole my heart? You know the story of Joshua? How many times will I have to walk around you to make you fall for me? I didn't know that angels flew this low. And did it hurt you when you fell from heaven? You must need forgiveness because it's a sin to look as good as you do. <laughs> and then one says, I have the gift of prophecy and I see you in my future. And then the last one, I just want you to know I put the stud in Bible study. <laughs> that one's pretty bad. Well, yes, you may have your love story and that's great. But I want to tell you, there is the greatest love story ever told. Now, there's many ways we might study this greatest love story, but I want us to look at something that you find in Ephesians 3, verses 17 through 19. There you read, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have, now look at some words, strength. Now, King James is able. The word really carries the idea of strength, but within context, you kind of might think able. Because strength with comprehension, but nevertheless, strength to comprehend. Now, later on, we're going to see the word no, and they kind of fit hand in glove, don't they? Strength to understand. Then he says, with all the saints. In other words, this love story so great. It's not just for you to know. Everyone needs to know and comprehend this love story. And then he says, and he uses four words. What is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth? And then says, and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. Now, this has always impressed me because he's saying, you know something. It's almost like saying, you know something. You need to know something. But it's beyond your ability to know it. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. That's why I say, this is the greatest love story ever told. Now, I want us to study this greatest love story ever told. Now, sometimes you might say, okay, what are we to comprehend? Well, if you read enough folks, they're going to tell you, well, maybe he meant comprehend the truth. Maybe he meant comprehend the mystery of the calling of the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Or maybe comprehend the church of God. Or maybe comprehend the cross. But I think within the context, the idea of you comprehend. Now, I know someone might say, wait, he says comprehend. Then he says, know the love of Christ. 
So maybe there's a comprehend this and know the love of Christ. I think he's talking about the same thing. He wants them to comprehend and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. And so we're going to see this is the greatest love story ever told because of the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of this great love. And this is how we're going to study this passage this morning. To see the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth. Now some people have said, well, this, this breadth, length, height, depth, there's no specific meaning of each or no specific references of each. Rather, it's just speaking of these dimensions to imply and a love that's so great it's to infinity. Well, I can understand that, and I can appreciate that. But I also do think that we could begin to study this from the aspect of breadth, length, height, and depth. Now, I would be quick to say, be very quick to say, that Paul did not identify in this passage specifically what he meant by breadth, length, height, and depth. And so there is an element that as we look at this, somebody might say, well, that's your opinion. And, and, and I would say, okay, yes, it is. But I think it well illustrates truly that greatest love story ever told of Jesus' love for me and Jesus' love for you. It's great because of the breadth. The breadth, Jesus' love encompasses all. There's nobody outside the bounds of his love. Jesus loves me, this I know. And another child song, Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. Well, I want to tell you something. It's easy to love children, but it's not so easy to love sometimes us when we're not doing so right. One way that children sing this Jesus loves me song Jesus loves me when I'm good and I do the things I should Jesus loves me when I'm bad you remember the next but it makes him very sad you know the reality is we aren't so good you know as you would consider our righteousness Isaiah put it this way all our righteousness are like filthy rags. In other words, if you stacked up all of our goodness, there's still sin and evil in our lives. One of the passages so well expresses this is Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. And I want you to see there, here we see evidence and statements of God's love and of Jesus' love. You read, Christ died. You read, God shows His love for us. You read, Christ died for us. That we embrace, and we're so glad to read and see. But notice, notice how undeserving we are of his sacrifice and of his love. You see, we were weak. Weak? We were undeserving because we were ungodly. And looking towards the end of that passage, because we were sinners. If someone's thinking their goodness will save them, they're wrong. If someone is thinking my morality alone will save, it will not. No matter how good. You see, we still are sinners. Romans declares we're all guilty of sin. You read about the sins of the Gentiles in Romans chapter 1, the sins of the Jews in Romans chapter 2, and you get to chapter 3 and you read what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks all are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. And no one understands. No one seeks for God. Continuing in verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped. And look, the whole world may be held accountable King James Version says guilty to God. It's like the gavel of God, guilty. And so we read there of our sins. 
Most, if not familiar with all these other passages, yes, of this one verse, Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God's love, that love of Christ, it is for all. And the all are undeserving. And the all are sinners. And the all have at some point turned their back on their God and disobeyed. It's one reason it's the greatest love story ever. You know, among men, among men, there are all sorts of prejudice, bias, and partiality. And sometimes it's on the basis of color and race. And sometimes it's for other reasons. Many years ago, and it, it, it goes back many years ago, there was a couple in town that were military, they were at Gunner and met them, and we had some Bible studies with them, and they were both baptized. But an interesting thing about this couple is she was, her roots were Cuban. Her parents had left with her from Cuba when she was just a baby, and they lived down in South Florida. Well, then her husband, his parents had come from Colombia. Now, just frankly, if you look at them, they, they look the same. Now, uh, as far as their skin, a little more on the brown side. But they look the same. But you know, when they decided to marry, the families were against it. Because you see, her family wanted her to marry of someone from her community, the Cuban community. And his family wanted him to marry from someone of her community, a, a Colombian community. Prejudice exists for all sorts of reasons among men. The friends with God, this impartial God of ours, who does not know respect of persons, it's the whole world that he loves. For God so loved the world. And this is why... This is the greatest love story because the breadth of that love is so great. It encompasses all men. The breadth of Jesus' love. And then notice the length. He mentioned the breadth, the length, the height, the depth. The length. Someone might say, what about the length of Jesus' love? Let me suggest to you this idea, that Jesus' love is from eternity to eternity. I know that here we are in 2017, literally knocking at the door of 2018. And it's hard for us to comprehend, you know, a hundred years, much less in the beginning. Much less! What existed before in the beginning? And it's hard for us to imagine and understand what truly eternity is when we pass from this life. But yet, Jesus' love, we could say, is from eternity to eternity. Jesus himself, he was from eternity to eternity. We read in John 17, 5, as Jesus was praying, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So there Jesus was before we had a, ever had a world. He was eternal. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And then in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, in context, as you read that, it's speaking of Jesus. And so these three passages and a lot of other ways to study the eternal nature of Jesus. These three passages, Jesus has always been. And friends, Jesus has always loved us. Look at Jeremiah 31, 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I've loved you with an everlasting love. You know, as you see, if we were to say, how do we know Jesus loves us? Uh, the cross, the cross. 
would be the answer. And you see that Jesus' sacrifice was planned from eternity. 1 Peter 1, 19, 20, With the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, without spot, he indeed was, look at this, foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. It, it sounds like this plan for Jesus to die, showing his love for me and for you, foreordained, from the foundation of the world. His promises for you. They were planned from eternity. Look at Matthew 25 verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right. Come you are my blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Look at this. From the foundation of the world. Jesus love, the greatest love story ever told because it encompassed all men and has been forever. You know, sometimes man and woman, a boy and girl speak of falling in love or falling out of love. No such thing with Jesus because we see the greatest length, eternity to eternity of his love. But in addition to the breadth and the length. We see the depth of Jesus' love. The depth. We see that Jesus left heaven coming down to earth, even to the death on a cross. Philippians 2, beginning in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, that though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. This kind of begins, if you would, the descent of Jesus for me and for you. There he was with God in heaven, having the glory with the Father, but made himself nothing, emptied himself. What did this mean for him to do this? He took on the form of a servant. And if we're wondering exactly what that means, he describes it there. Being born in the likeness of men. Didn't end there, you see, because you see, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even the death on a cross. Here in about three verses, we find Jesus in heaven to earth in the form of a man, one of his created beings, who dies and dies that cruel death of the cross. That is the depth of his love. An amazing love indeed. We sometimes, at least I grew up singing this song, Why did my Savior come to earth? Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lowly birth? Because he loved me so. The second verse is, Why did he drink the bitter cup of sorrow, pain, and woe? And why on the cross he lifted up? Because he loved me so. And then the chorus, He loved me so, he loved me so. He gave his precious life for me. For me. Because he loved me so. A song you might hear the teens sometimes singing. A devotional song, Lord, I lift your name on high. It says, you came from heaven to earth to show me the way, from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. And again, it's expressing, isn't it? The depth of the love that Jesus had for us to go all the way from heaven to the cross. This is the greatest love story ever told because of the breath. It's all men that he loves. Because of the length, he's always loved us. It's from eternity to eternity. Because of the depth, he went from heaven all the way to the cross. But it's also the greatest love story because of the height. The height of that love. And as I look at this, I think in terms of where he's going to take his people. 
in Ephesians 1, 20, now look at this. It says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now that's about Jesus. Jesus is in the heavenly places. And he would say, well, where's that? Well, you're probably not even questioning where that is. But I want you to know just the next chapter. And raise us up with him. And seated us with him. In heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. The height. He seated us. In heavenly places. In 2 Thessalonians 2.16. He says now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And God the Father. Who loved us. And gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Again, he's lifted us up. And we can have that eternal comfort. Paul, he is nearing his death. And he's nearing his death with hope. He says... Henceforth, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Again, because of Jesus' love, he lift us up. To such a height as that promise of heaven itself. Yes, the greatest love story because of the breadth and the length and the depth and the height of this love. Whether it's Nothing specific to be known or learned from breadth, length, height, depth. And it just speaks of this infinite nature of his love. I think we can see how in some way, yes it is, a breadth and length, height and the depth. Becoming then the greatest love story ever told. You know, I had asked... For two songs to be sung before the sermon. And the first, Jesus loves me, this I know. And we know the song, and it expresses well the fact of Jesus' love. But then the next song was, My Jesus, I love thee. And in that song, it talks about our love for Jesus and partially even because uh, we love him because he's, of what he's done for us. And you know, that's the way I'd like to leave this, this greatest love story ever told. You know, I'm really glad that when I asked Tish, August or December, she said December. You know, I, I never really asked her, will you marry me? I maybe I ought to do that. <laughs> um, but you know, there's a response, right? There's a response. The greatest love story ever told is, is Jesus saying to me, to you, I love you. I love all of you. I've loved you always. I loved you so much I left heaven. And I love you so much, I want to take you to heaven. But it requires a response from me or for you. We need to be loving him, but we need to respond initially with faith, believing this. Turning from our sin, that's repentance, to confess our faith and then be too immersed, uh, buried with him in baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
And then if we've done that, not live faithful, we need to get it right. Get back on that, that track of loving our Lord. If we could assist you with baptism this morning, if we could assist you by praying for you, if you need to come, please come as we stand and sing.